Welcome to Web Systems Week 3. This week we're going to talk about web and security. In fact, most of us, when we tend to think of security, tend to think of certain things about internet security. For example, loading malware like viruses, trojans, worms, things like that. Or we worry about things like how to access a system, our user IDs, logins, how do we access certain resources. For example, accessing DreamSpark or something like that. Or that our laptops might get stolen. Or our USB keys left behind in the lab. Or our public website's been vandalised. Or somebody's been stealing your assignments and submitting it. Or somebody's been stealing my exams. All these sorts of threats about security is a very huge topic. And we actually have two separate subjects just to cover them. So, in essence, there's only three main things we tend to look at for security. For example... There's confidentiality, how to keep things safe. Integrity, how do we stop things being mucked around and broken or stolen. And availability, what's the point in having a system if it's not working. So let's take a brief look at these and we'll come back and take a look at these specific examples towards UTS, Linux Gym and Unix. Let's look at the first concept, confidentiality. This is where you need to keep information accessible only to authorized users and that is we need to check can it be seen by whom when where and how for example can't be seen let's make sure we encrypt the information so we cannot see it unless we have the decryption ability let's check the authentication make sure people log in find out who they are what can they access let's check out when they can access it can it be online at UTS, offline, from home. About where? What sort of access controls do we have? Do we say that only staff can access your public website? And what about other information like how's it transmitted? HTTP, HTTPS, is it transmitted by email? All those sort of things we need to think about quite clearly. Let's look at the second concept, integrity. Now the key thing is we may be authorized, we might have access to the information, we're in the correct location, we've used the right protocols. What if somebody alters stuff? So you enter in a credit card for buying something from eBay and suddenly you have 10 orders instead of one. Obviously the vendor will be very happy, you won't be. So let's check the information. So we need to make sure the information is correct, it's processed correctly, and finally it hasn't been changed without you knowing it's been changed whether in storage, that is on the disk, or in transit, for example, over the web. We also need to be able to detect it. And typical ways we can do that is through things like, for example, auto trails, a log, typically what's called. We have a special mathematical means, which we'll talk about later, called hashes, checksums, and digests. The third triad, sorry, wrong word to use there, triad. Um, the third concept we need to be aware of is availability. Now, it's great having a system that's secure and safe, but if nobody can access it, what's the point? So it might be more than just simple security aspects. It could be systems like, is it available? If our website dies, UTS Online dies, for example, you cannot do your classes. So we need to have multiple systems. We call hot and cold standby systems. Um, can the systems resist attacks? Now, UTS Online is accessible from the general web. What if we get hit? by a concerted attack from the US, or from China, from India, or somewhere like that. Will the system survive or not? And finally, for example, internal systems, payroll systems, for example, we can only access that from within UTS. So nobody from outside UTS can actually access our system called NEO, which is our staff management system. So to protect ourselves, we need to be aware of how to break up all these different types of security systems into general concepts. And these general concepts are things like security services, security mechanisms, to defend against a particular type of security attack. So a typical security ser service could be something that makes use of a security mechanism, and then the security mechanism I'll talk about in a few minutes, and we need to identify what sort of attacks there are that these security services protect us against. In order to work out the security mechanism to counter a security attack, 
it's probably a good idea to know what sort of security attacks are out there. In a normal situation, we're only interested in one thing, getting information point A to point B, like that. And for example, an information source could be the web, www, and our destination could be a browser. Okay, that's a normal situation. What happens if it changes? Let's take a look again. I see an information from the web and pow, can't get through. I am not happy. That's an interruption, not good news. The question asked is, what type of security attack is it? That's called an availability attack. Simple as that. So let's take a look at another type of attack. Interception. So here I am entering my credit card. And I send it to my website. And somebody makes a copy. And I suddenly find my credit card is out of money put a big negative sign in front of that. Again, unhappy Chris. What sort of attack is that one? You might want to ask, what sort of attack is that one? It's a confidentiality attack. Somebody has sniffed my web connection and grabbed my credit card. Not good news. So what about another type of interception? I decide to buy, I decide to pay $1,000 into Chris Wong's account. So let's take a look at an example. I send a thousand dollars. I send it to Mr. Evil. Who changes it to ten thousand dollars? I'm not saying I'm evil. It's another type of attack. You're suddenly nine thousand dollars out of money. Not a good attack to have. That's a classic example of an integrity attack. Not good news either. Pretty awful news for you and me. What about the next attack? Fabrication. Well, that's an easy one. I'm not even involved. And this is Mr. Evil. I'll draw Mr. Evil again. He decides to make a fake credit card for $10,000 into this account. But I'm not involved at all. What happens? That's a fabrication attack. That's not good news. So somebody's faked my credit card. So the question is, what sort of attack is that? And that's a classic example of what we call an authenticity attack. In other words, somebody's stolen my identity and maybe just my credit card and made use of my money. Not a good example. I hate it. Typically what happens when people look over your shoulder? and see you typing in your credit card number and your card expiry date and the uh, credit card code, that four three digit thing on the back of the card. Or they just read your PIN number from an ATM. Another good example. So let's take a look at the type of typical security services you might need. Obviously I mentioned CIA. Full on example. Stuff we talked about earlier. But there's other things that work with the type of security services out there. Good example, non-repudiation. We want to make sure that you promise you're going to do something and you actually will guarantee it happens. Good example, when you pay by PayPal. When you click yes to pay, that's it. They keep a track that you're not, you can't reverse the order. Access controls. If you're a student or staff, you have different levels of access. Simple as that. And availability. Once I've committed to paying my something for with a credit card, it can't be changed. So I've got to make sure that somehow in somebody's system, the credit card value is not changed. Again, a difficult thing to do. And we'll look at the type of services that solve these problems in the next few slides. The first service, and probably the most common one when people think of security, is encryption. The idea of encryption is to basically make sure that something is converted to something that people can't read 
unless they're authorized to. So here's some examples. A classic technique um, to basically encrypt in the old days was a, was a concept called scrambling. Uh, it's a very trivial type of encryption. And here's an example of ROT13. Basically, ROT13 is also known as a Caesar cipher. And it's, yes, it's been around since the days of the Romans, a long time ago. So here's an example. The butler did it, might get translated to this. G-U-R, the, butler, did, it. You need to try to work out what the encryption rule is. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about that and see if you can work out the pattern. Well, pause, continue, your wish. What the ROT13 algorithm does is simply shifts the characters by 13. Assuming A is 1 and N is 13, B could be 2 and O is 14, and so on and so on. What happens at the end when we hit Z? It goes back to A, so N becomes A. So let's try this out. H, that becomes U. H becomes U. E becomes R. L becomes Y. And O, oh dear, O is not here. So let's take a look. O becomes B. So let's take O becomes B. Good news. A very simple algorithm. The previous example is an example where we shared two secrets. The secrets we actually shared were the actual key, which is 13, and the algorithm, which is called a rotation algorithm. So the password would be passed was 13, if we all knew it was a rotation theory algorithm. If I actually said the password was 5, for example, we rotate everything by 5, so A becomes E, for example, we simply know the word 5, and we can pass it on. That's actually a password in this particular case. Of course, we could have incredibly complex passwords like password or secret or one two three four again it's symmetric you share the secret so the biggest issue is what happens if I need to exchange this is the killer good example I have a document I have a document called <coughs> exam and I encrypt it and I encrypt it using a password one two three four and I want to pass it to my tutors I don't want to pass it to my tutors, or three of them. Of course, I trust them, totally, but because I might say, hey, the password is 1234, somebody might listen. And that person might hear the actual password, 1234. If they ever get a copy of the exam, even though it's encrypted, they can now read it. The problem is, this 1234 has been shared, this password and I can't stop it. Once it's out there, everybody could hypothetically know it. What do we do in this situation? One way to solve this is a technique called public key cryptography. It's using mathematics. The idea is each party has two keys, public and private key, and the, the two halves are linked together by an algorithm of some kind. And typically, a good example of an algorithm is called the RSA one, which is based on prime numbers and factoring. So here's an example of two halves of a key. Typically you might have a private key, that's PVT, that picture, and the public key. The two, when separate, don't mean anything, but when together, form one single shape. In this case, it could be the actual algorithm itself. That's a typical example. It's very simplistic, but it's very complicated in terms of mathematics. Basically, the idea is you encrypt with one half of the key, and decrypt with the other. So I encrypt with that half, and then I can decrypt with the other half. The single beauty about this concept is it happens to work with all the four major security capacities that we mentioned earlier. For example, you can authenticate with it. Basically, you encrypt with your private key and decrypt with the public key. So you have the two halves, it's asymmetrical. With privacy, you encrypt with your with the receiver's public key and only the receiver can decrypt it with their public key. Data integrity. Basically, you can 
encrypt it and if you ever try to change the contents it won't decrypt so you know something's wrong and the same thing with non-repudiation did I pay or not there's another way of checking because only you have your private key everybody else can see your public key so if you encrypt with your public key basically people can double check that it was encrypted with your public key simple as that and this is the essence of web security I believe most of you have probably seen SSL you probably know it as HTTPS and what happens is your browser will pop up with something that says hey this is encrypted or not usually a little um, lock in the top left hand corner or the, the bar goes green or some indication this has a really interesting feature it provides the whole CIA stack confidentiality you can prevent interception it's got integrity stops modification and not always but it's two-way authentication usually it verifies the owner of a website part of the SSL algorithm uses a thing called digital signatures which I'll talk about in a moment it actually uses both types of encryption algorithms it uses a public key cryptography um, basically your browser has half a key in it and the web server has the other part of a key and they share each other what actually happens is they have a handshake and they agree on a encryption algorithm and they partially pass a secret to each other it's a once-off key which is only used for that session and a good example is to look at the video if you've got some time click on this video it gives you a good overview of how SSL actually works I'll let you look at it at your own leisure another technique used by the web to stop a security attack especially uh, modification and uh, non-repudiation technique called hashing the idea is you put a mathematical algorithm against a piece of code or data or something like that and basically it ensures that data is not modified so let's take a look at how it actually works the idea is you do a thing like a sum for example a checksum you add up the characters remember A could be 1 B could be 2 simply add them all up and you have a magic number at the end and then you encrypt that number with the, with the send with your own private key and the receiver uses your public key to decrypt it and they use the same algorithm we'll do a checksum we'll add the, for example we add the letters up one two three four five six seven eight whatever and then use the public key to match that number if the number's not the same as when you sent it and what they worked out to be something's been modified it's a very good example of hashing and digital certificates and we typically use this for things like secure email we don't use this at UTS um, but theoretically if you're sending emails between say lawyers you can actually secure your email you can digitally sign email and your clients would actually get something saying this was sent from Chris Wong they decrypt it using my public key and say yes this is correct or it's been signed correctly um, if you're fortunate enough to use um, Adobe Acrobat you can actually sign documents electronically and Adobe has that option when you create and even when you receive emails you can say I've received it for example it's also used very by Microsoft when you install software it'll say do you want to accept do you want to install this or not if the code has not been signed by Microsoft it will give you a prompt saying this software is not being signed by Microsoft do you want to install yes or no Microsoft use that hashing to stop people distributing fake copies of software like a fake copy of Microsoft Office for example another service that we use offered is called authentication and this is one that a lot of people do think is what security is about as well it's used for many things for example who are you what's your authority level are you part of UTS are you allowed to use this application that's a big one that I see a lot an example of an application you might be using could be UTS online are you allowed to access our website simple as that and the thing is how do we work out who is this person it could be a password it could be something else so let's take a look at some examples 
probably the most obvious one is a password or a PIN number. We have our we have go to a website, you type in your user ID and password. That's something that you know and hopefully you've never shared with anybody else. When I go to an ATM, I type in my PIN code. Again, only I know who that PIN code well, maybe my wife does too, but hopefully not. It could be something that you've got. For example, I don't know if you've seen this thing, it's called an RSID, it's called a secure ID from RSA. These numbers actually change every minute and it's synchronized with your server. So you may log on with a password, it'll ask for your secure ID pin, you type in the number, in this case 1234836, and that lets you log in. Um, it could be a token. Here's an example of a token. It's a USB key. It could be a, a PIN card. For example, your credit card. That's a physical object that you have. You stick it in the machine and you have a PIN code as well. Two-factor authentication. Very useful. Another one I didn't really mention and I should since it's becoming very popular is SMS. If you log on to Gmail, you can set two-factor authentication. When you log in, for the first time on that browser, it'll send an SMS of a magic code to you, to your telephone. On your phone, you simply type it, you, on your phone you'll get a, a number like G1234. You type it into the website and it lets you in. Much more secure. You can't get that in Nigeria because your phone is here in Sydney. Another mechanism to use is, for example, something that you are. Good example. A lot of these, um, for example, the iPhone 6 onwards has a fingerprint reader. If you have an uh, IBM ThinkPad, they often have a fingerprint printer as well. Um, I actually worked at a place which had a palm reader and fingerprint. You put your whole palm on it. It actually read your prints, and you still had to type in a PIN number to get into the machine room. Um, you might have seen retinal scans on science fiction movies like um, Mission Impossible or things like that. Again, it's a possibility. Face recognition has become very, very popular. Lenovo machines have had this for years, and now you can do it through passport control. It looks at your face and recognises it. I haven't seen voice recognition becoming very popular because, quite frankly, you can record it. I suppose you could do the same with a face, but it's probably easier to fake a recording. So authentication works. I'm in. It knows that I am Chris Wong. Chris is cool. But the question is, can Chris access many things? For example, can I, am I enrolled in web systems? Not really. I'm an instructor. Could I, for example, have access to programming fundamentals? Not unless I'm authorized to do it. What about social engineering? Other classic tricks. You get a, fo a phone call. You say, look, I'm the, I'm the system administration of a system. Can you tell me what the root password is? Probably won't get it, but they might work it out. So you need to know who you are. When you get certain certain um, identification documents, like a passport, for example, you often need things like letters of introductions. They need to see your photo. You need things signed in many places. They need to be issued somewhere and somehow. Somebody has to do it. So a good example is we need to check, are you real or not? So the question is, who's it issued by? Now, in the web, real World Wide Web, there's many top-level organizations that will validate a company. For example, there's a company called RSA, for example. There's companies called VeriSign, for example. Or there's even government companies like OzCert. They can validate and vouch for your internet presence. And they'll put a date on it. They say this is valid for the next five years. Might be because you simply have a loan, you're paying a license for five years. That could be money. Who knows what it is? So keep that in mind. Authentication is important, but to verify who you actually are and are you the right person is another story altogether. So the question becomes where do we authenticate? Now, the perimeter, for example, could be the website www, or it could be, for example, the door physical things, it could be the operating system, the login prompt, the application itself, or all three. Who knows? It's up to you to work it out. For example, let's have a quick poll. What are the processes for students? Well, obviously we've got a PIN number, 
if you're accessing buildings uh, 10 and uh, a few other buildings which don't have the key cards yet, we might have a card, your student card, you have a password. There's many processes out there. So what happens with staff who are students as well? They happen to have exactly the same process, but what we do is they get a staff number as well as a student number. So we have two separate user accounts with different levels of authority. But it can be painful because what happens if you're a student who's a research student and a coursework student? You need to be aware of multiple student lists. That's a really hard thing to do, but we'll leave that for another subject like network servers where I talk about that. Another example, let's go back to our web example. Um, let's log on to the web. We typically will have a pop-up. Here's an example. I logged on to the uh, UTS staff website with my own account. It'll ask me to log in. This is what we call basic authentication. The idea is we simply have a user and we enter a password. Fundamental problem is the password is transmitted in the clear. Despite the fact it says asterisk, 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 the computer at the other end and the network itself can see that password. It's scrambled slightly like our ROT13 algorithm. I think it's more like a ROT64 algorithm but it's still easy. It's super trivial to, to break. Like what I said trivial, it is beyond trivial. You talk about two seconds of computing time in modern computers, it's done. Not a very good encryption algorithm. But it was simple in the old days of the 1980s. Um, there's other types of authentication out there. There's a thing called web forms. Now this is good because notice it's green. See that? HTTPS. Good news. So when we type in our student number, we happen to have that 12341 password 1 are transmitted in an encrypted web page so nobody can see it. The third type of general web security is what we call client-side certificates. Like I said earlier, a third party has validated who you are and they've given you an electronic key card. Usually it's just a file with a password on it, but it's actually an encrypted password embedded inside some special type of file called a client-side certificate. And this is an example one used by the tax office. If you pay, pay for example, uh, you need to access uh, restricted sites like paying your tax as a business, they have a thing called OzKey, which is very useful. OzKey, it's actually a Java application that runs in your browser. Java, not a good idea, but still exists. And what it does is it actually sends an encrypted key to the government and it says this is you and it's actually a legal signature as far as the government's concerned. So let's take a look back at Unix. Now Unix has authentication as well and typically it's by user ID and password. Again, not the world's best practice but that's the way it is at the moment. In most cases it's fairly trivial. They're stored in a file called etc password. If you log on to the Linux workstations, use the old famous cat command, cat, etc. password, even on Linux Gym, and you'll see it's a simple plain type file that has a user ID and a whole bunch of information. There's a special file that stores the password in encrypted format called etc. shadow. That's etc. shadow. And that actually contains the encrypted passwords. However, most of you cannot view that because it's a highly protected file. Biggest problem is that file is only a flat file. It's like an edit, a plain text file. So how do you deal with thousands of users? We call larger scale typically thousands or even hundreds of users. We store them in a database called a directory service. Microsoft actually have one called Active Directory and everybody else uses one called LDAP. Okay, LDAP directories and Active Directories. By the way, Active Directory actually does contain LDAP. So Active Directory contains LDAP as well as Microsoft ISMs. And at UTS, we're set up to have a central database called ADS Root. So whenever you log onto any workstation, e.g. in um, outside of say building one or building five or building four, you actually will log in using your student number and your email password. It's the same password. Here's an example. Um, if you log on to email, it goes to ADS root, my student admin, 
UTS Online, they all use the same password, the same user ID. It's the same system. Now, a lot of you had problems accessing, especially if you, those of you from outside the faculty, because at FATE, the Faculty of Engineering and IT, we have our own separate directory called, strangely enough, FATE. And it's the same user ID, 1234-5678, and the same password because it's linked to the two systems. They're called synchronization. I think the update happens every hour or every few minutes. So if you change your password here, it'll change it also on FATE as well. Two places you can change it. There's a third authentication system. Now, notice we asked you to do that start.it.utsedu.au reset. That actually updated another system called IT. We keep the two in sync with the FATE system, but it's a manual process. It's actually run, I guess, every five, ten minutes. They keep the two in sync, but it's not automatic. In fact, sometimes the update actually happens overnight, which is not very good news if you change your password in one system, not the other. So just be careful of that. Usually it's immediate or within the next couple of minutes, not always. And we've got a third one. Now that, by the way, this is why you have a separate login from Linux. It's actually that alphameric user, username from the start .it.utsedu.au reset. On Linux Gym, we have a third system we're using a flat file. And unfortunately, this system is rather sad because it's manually updated. I actually update these passwords, and that's why you've got the trivial passwords called your student number. Not a good system. It will be linked one day to Linux, but that's not going to happen for a long time. So what other types of security accesses have we got? Well, we've got computer-based ones, but an obvious one is physical. We use, well, we don't use swipe cards, but we use our touch cards instead. We can access rooms, typically a token, or you might have a security guard who might let you in. I actually worked in a data center where we actually had uh, what we call airlock arrangements, when you could get in, but you couldn't get out unless you got typed a PIN number in as well. So they could lock you in and call the police if you were trying to sneak in with somebody's stolen card. It could be a logical access control. A good example it's firewalls. You can't access the student workstations at all. The B11 workstations can't be accessed from outside. Definitely not. That's being enforced by a thing called a firewall. Uh, it could be enforced by an application, for example, UTS Online. You can't access, for example, uh, advanced database programming because you're first year students. But in all cases, we have to configure it somehow. And that, again, takes time and effort. You need to work out what's worth it. Topic. Unix. You'll need to know this stuff for the week three labs. And you'll also need to know it for the uh, assignment. So typically you have access controls that you have to deal with in Unix. Usually it's three levels of security. You have a user. The owner of the file can do something. A group. Users can be in groups or other people. And they're grouped into three sets of types of permissions. You can read it, or you can write it, or you can execute it, which means you can run the file, or you can traverse, which means you can go down. You can go down, change directory to whatever. Okay, you set permissions on www. If it's got the X, you can go into that directory. And they're grouped in threes. So this first lot means the user. The second lot means the group. The third lot means others. This little indication in the front is only for directory. So if you see a minus sign, minus, R, minus, minus, R, minus, minus, let's say one, two, three, this file would be readable only by the user and the group and not by others. If you see something like this, for example, that means users, groups, and others can write. Strangely enough, you'll be very careful with this, because if you take permission off yourself, that's this one, 
you can't even read write your own file. Again, you can change permissions. So look at the lab today, the Linux Gym Labs, that teaches you how to set these permissions, for Unix anyway. What else do we need to be aware of? Now, the last security mechanism we mentioned was audit logs. It's essential. For example, I need to work out if violations happen. It's really for catching. If we need to catch anything that happens wrong, we catch the violations and they're logged. Typically, they show little red X's somewhere. And it says, Chris has tried to access the uh, payroll system. Mm, not a good idea. You can do forensics. For example, you can say, hey, Chris has tried 15,000 times to access the payroll system. I think you'd be aware that something seriously wrong there. But if you see it once, Chris tried to access the payroll system once on a Thursday morning when payday is due, you could say, well, he was accessing it once. That's the only time he did it. it. Might have been a mistake. So you have different actions depending on what happens. You can only work it out through the logs. And it's dependent on your security needs. Payroll, passwords, these are very important systems. But it doesn't matter if I look up the canteen um, recipe list. I don't think I really care that much. So it depends on your own needs. So that brings us to the final risk assessment. Why do we care about security? And why bother? It all depends on your needs. For example, do you need to protect UTS EDUAU? Well, I don't know if you might have heard that some of the public websites of the university have been attacked. Uh, LOL's rules or something like that. Bad news. Or here's an example. There was a crash in Florida quite a few years ago, 1997. Somebody hacked it and they changed the front page of AirTrans to say, uh, ValueJet, sorry, changed its name to AirTrans and um, we killed a few people. Big deal. Bad reputational damage. Didn't cost them any money, but it cost them reputations instead. So we need to always balance our needs with what we actual costs are. So in some, our security should match what that risk assessment is. We need to be aware whether it's internal or external. Classic case, internal hacks are people who steal money from you. Bank employees is a good example. Or external threats. There's cyber warfare happening now. Vandalism occurs. It could be politically motivated. It could be industrial espionage. It happens a lot. It could be simple theft, and that's a classic. So if you have a chance to, you to think about where you need to go with security. If, for example, it's so hard to access a system, people will bypass security. If you ever go to an office, look under a keyboard, you might find a password. You might find a post pad attached to a screen with a really complicated password rule, so people write it down because they can't remember it. What happens there? Consider your users. Now, I'd like you to have a little exercise if you could. Just think about it, maybe post on the discussion board. Have you spotted any security risks or flaws at UTS? But be very careful. Make sure you don't violate any rules. Okay, we don't want my students caught and kicked out of the university for violating security. It's really important. It's a business issue as well as a technology issue. I shouldn't say not, but in, as well as a technology issue. We need to look at all these issues. But for this subject, it's not a big focus, but we need to be very aware of it. So we have to do it cleanly and carefully. If you want to do any further study, fundamental security is another one to look at, as well as as well as the follow-on subject, 48730, network security. We've dealt a lot with security in this online lecture. One of the big things you really do need to know and understand is how to use the Unix permissions. You'll do this in Linux Gym Chapter 3, but you'll also need to look at it for your web assignment because you need to set up security for a directory called public HTML under your account. So that user ID is your account. It's your account, not my, not the word user ID. And you need to set permissions up so you can make a public web page. So pay attention to the assignment. You can also find the instructions on how to actually do set up permissions for your public website by looking at the website www.student.it.uts.edu by itself. Don't type in that funny tool or user ID. 
look at it, it'll give you a step-by-step -step instruction on how to set up the first part of the security on your website. Do not set up user authentication. You can experiment in a different directory, but not in the web system directory, since I need to use that to actually mark your assignments. So thank you very much, and I hope you realize security is such a huge topic. We actually have another two subjects dealing with this whole topic just by itself. Thank you.